today's webcast. Uh, this is the third in our continuing weekly series of COVID-19 related tax matters, which I hope you're enjoying. My name is Rhys Penning. I'm the head of indirect tax with KPMG in the UAE in Oman, and we'll be hosting today's session. All of our lives and livelihoods have been impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak, the most serious global health crisis of our lifetime. And we, of course, hope that you, your family, your friends, colleagues, and business partners are safe and well. Given the disruption to international trade flows, transfer pricing, and the repricing of transactions will be a matter of intense focus for tax authorities across the world. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the OECD's BEPS agenda and the economic diversification agendas of various governments, which are usually financed through taxation and public spending, survive the rise in national self-interest. Next slide, please. Our presenters today are drawn from across our um, GCC network. We have Zubair Patel, who is a tax and corporate service partner in Kuwait. Philip Vukovic, the UAE and regional transfer pricing lead, uh, and joined by Stefan El Khoury, the transfer pricing lead in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Slide, please. After Zubair rounds out our discussion of the last two sessions regarding GCC government responses by outlining the position in Kuwait, Philip and Stefan will focus on transfer pricing and interna international tax matters, an agenda which has been informed based on our regional and local experience and that of the entire KPMG global network. Now, of course, while we do our best to cover a range of topics, things are moving so quickly, it may not be possible to cover all matters specific to you and your business. So we encourage you to get in touch with your local KPMG contact to discuss your, you, your unique situation and to identify the best solution for you going forward. Slide, please. So as I said, this is the third in our continuing series of webcasts. So please provide your feedback at the end of today's session so that we can continue to improve. If you've got any technical questions, please use the question mark button on the screen and a member of our team will reach out to you. You can also use the chat box in the player to raise queries, which we will attempt to address at the end of uh, today's session. With that, I hope you enjoy. Uh, welcome to our webinar and I will pass over to Zubair from Kuwait. Yeah, thank you, Reese. Thank you very much. And uh, just uh, say everybody good afternoon and hope you're all safe and healthy. Uh, at your homes or at work, as the case may be. So I think we'll just slide, start with this slide. So great, if next slide, please, we can look at the contents. Yeah, so I think Kuwait, just like all the GCC countries have obviously responded uh, from all sort of uh, measures, uh, not just the fact that, you know, they've, on, they've since 12th of March, uh, we have been in a state of, uh, lockdown and I've been requested to stay at home, both the government as well as the private um, corporates. Um, are, quite a few of them are working remotely. Only those which are specifically allowed to be open are, are working during the non-curfew hours. Uh, post 12th of March, we also had um, a partial curfew, which is from 5 p.m. in the evening going up to 6 a.m. in the morning. And what we have heard since yesterday's cabinet decision has, has been that during Ramadan, that would be extended. So we'll have a curfew. I guess nobody can come out from 4 p.m. in the evening, uh, going up to 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so I think so I think what effectively um, this has led to quite a lot of our MNC clients um, are requesting, you know, in terms of restriction of movement, the impact on the business is something that we are sort of, you know, working with those clients and uh, the challenges that they have been having uh, in terms of their staff members. And I think uh, just focusing on tax, I think um, what's, what's, what's been happening during this time uh, is that as the profession, the big four plus the other two firms, we wrote to the Ministry of Finance clearly. Uh, that for any deadlines that fall during this time, the period that the Ministry of Finance has been closed should be ex extended. So the letter that we wrote to them on the 25th of March, we requested particularly extension uh, of all work that was due during this, um, during this period of closure uh, to be extended by minimum 30 days. And then any filing, which is the December filing, which were due 15th of April, should be extended by, by three months, as well as the payment for taxes. And the CRS deadline, which is a common reporting uh, you know, deadline, 
was the 31st of May. So that was requested to be extended and to be aligned with the FATCA deadline of 31st of August. And any penalty that might accrue on the installment that was due on this period of closure should also be waived along with the installments. So once I think we still await the actual um, documented ministerial order or circular coming from the Ministry of Finance in Kuwait, we understand this would come out when the Ministry of Finance opens. And the fact is now they're going to open 31st of May. So that actual response might be delayed. Um, so what, however, from the, we, we did get an email from the assistant under secretary herself stating that in there, they are looking to extend the, uh, the filing deadline by about two months, as well as the taxes, um, due as well. So that due date will also be extended. Um, in addition to that, we had also requested, and I think we have, this has been an ongoing communications for concessions for certain clients. For example, the installment basis, rather than just four installments, to allow six installments to pay their taxes. The team profit percentage, that is 30%. We've tried to um, sort of discuss with the Ministry of Finance to be cognizant of the, what's happening economically in the region and globally, that a 30% profit in these times is going to be extremely rare. So please. Uh, take a lower percentage in terms of a team profit percentage. And obviously the um, claim for financing costs, there are certain restrictions. So we've said, okay, because we will have a lot of head office um, supporting their branches. So that sort of claim should be increased for tax purposes. Uh, in addition to that, the loss ex losses should be extended to five years rather than three in terms of carry forward. So I think those are the things that we have requested. We are still uh, waiting to hear on the concessions uh, while the ministry is closed, but the discussions are going on. So I think we'll of course update and send out our KPMG update whenever uh, a formal notification is, is issued in this respect. So that was the response of the MOF. What's practically happened is that on our December year end, so in the absence of any formal notification, Quite a few companies have actually completed their filing. Obviously, the actual uh, submission of the documents, as Kuwait does not have an e system of filing, will be submitted once the MOF opens. But quite a lot of our foreign clients, as well as local clients, have actually bank transferred the money to the Ministry of Finance before the 15th of April. Um, the companies that do not have a choice or do not have sufficient liquidity, they've obviously said that look, when Ministry of Finance does open, then they will look at that and 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 uh, take appropriate actions in terms of what ministry of finance is trying to do remotely and again we are having discussions with them on a daily basis to be honest is they are cognizant of the fact of the kind of cash flow challenges that are being faced by the taxpayer uh, due to ministry of finance not issuing tax assessments because just to maybe a reminder uh, for the audience the once only the tax assessment is issued and paid for, there are no objection letters are issued for the release of the tax retentions, which are held by the contract owners. And in this time where you have, say, a hundred million dollar contract, I think that five million that is stuck with your contract owner would be really useful to pay your salary. So I think in terms of the no objection letters uh, for the release of retentions on suppliers, ministry is working on that remotely. Uh, any assessments, particularly for those you know, inspections that were completed, they are going to work and issue those assessments. Of course, the any other new assessments, particularly deemed profit and actual basis, that would really be dependent on a case by case that, that the inspector agrees to work remotely. So they are now that the um, the timing of the, uh, the curfew or the timing of the closure has been extended to eat break. Uh, they are obviously now looking at other measures to make sure that they're able to um, help companies in these times and issue them and no objection letters. Other challenges, I mean, other non-tax challenges that I'm often talking to quite a lot of our clients about is obviously the visa considerations and their families around. And particularly because the closure is now until 31st of May, a lot of um, people, a lot of uh, service providers, they come to Kuwait on a 30-day, 40-day visit visa, they attend business meetings, they have business development meetings. Unfortunately, quite a lot of them got stuck um, and their visa is has expired. What we understand, I think there was a news, obviously I would recommend you take your legal advice or you take advice from your 
your um, government relations officer. However, that any visa that were due to expire after the closure, i.e. 12th of March, have been extended up to 31st of May. And I think some of the flights have also started. Um, so I think that you should check, but yeah, I think the, fam but what it does is, I think just maybe, I guess, focusing on tax um, again, that the permanent establishment issues issues do uh, come through here. There's a lot of these people in Kuwait, as you are aware, there are, um, as you may be aware or may not be, that Kuwait does not define permanent establishment in their Kuwait tax regulation. So in practice, any presence of the staff could potentially create a tax filing position. So I think that's the key PE issue that that's sort of coming in. And I think on that note, I think we're talking about PE. It's probably the right time that I hand over to my colleague, Stefan, uh, who's going to cover this part in uh, as a part of his presentation. So over to you, Stefan, and thanks. From my side, um, that was quite an interesting oversight on, on what is happening in Kuwait. So good afternoon from my side, and I hope everybody is, is safe in, in this difficult time. Um, like he's mentioned, my name is Stefan Lakuri, and I'm leading the transfer pricing practice of uh, KPMG in Saudi Arabia and the Levant cluster. So we have heard from a couple of our presenters for now that COVID-19 obviously is a huge impact on our businesses. And of course, transfer pricing is at the heart of all these operations and the heart of the challenges that we may now face from an operational perspective and that we also may be faced at a later stage when discussing these positions with the tech authorities. That's why my colleague, Philippe and I, have developed a small uh, slide set that uh, basically will talk about the objectives that we think you should think about currently in your situation from a transfer price perspective. What are the potential measurements that you could take? And what would be a management or strategic approach of handling your transfer pricing positions? So these will be the three aspects that, that we're going to, to cover today in the presentation. And like we said in the beginning, of course, these are general positions that are based on our experience in transfer pricing and in the market in general. So, of course, any specific questions, please uh, raise your hand or please uh, shoot them to the, the chat box. We will happily take them later in the Q&A session. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what are the objectives that you as part of a multinational organization should now have in mind when thinking about your transfer pricing? So obviously the first concern should be cash taxes. So if you can avoid them in countries where while your overall position is significantly reduced from a profit perspective or you're even a lost position, that obviously should be your priority number one. So looking at cash taxes and making sure we don't pay cash taxes where we should not pay them or where we have other means of, of reallocating our, our profits. That leads me to the second objective, which is the transfer of losses to entities which actually can use these losses efficiently in the short term. So making sure that we have a right profit and now we have to also say a loss allocation within the group. And the third thing is to avoid heavy losses on what we call routine entities. So these are, for example, contract manufacturers, limited risk distributors. So any entity basically that is from its transfer pricing setup supposed to realize a small profit margin. So having now significant losses in this in these entities would not allow these entities efficiently to use these losses over time. So also there we need to rethink what should be our optimized transfer pricing position given the uh, circumstances of, of COVID-19. So I think these, these objectives all make sense from, from a business perspective. And now we need to think about the measures of how we can reach these objectives. And basically, we can split them into two, if you want, categories. So on the one side, there are measurements that are in line with the arm's length principle. And there are, on the other side, measurements that would be breaches of the arm's length principle. But certain governments have already uh, published these, these, these um, such measurements. 
that would actually allow you to breach the arms tax principle because of these exceptional circumstances. And for our presentation today, we will focus on the measurements that are in line with the arms tax principle because these are the measurements that we think are more realistic and more, more um, reliable in terms of what governments could be implemented and what governments would be accepting from, from a multinational organization. So with that being said, I hand over to my colleague Philip, who will talk you through the different measurements. Thank you very much, Stefan, and hello, everybody. It's nice to be on the other side. And thank you, Reese, for stepping in to moderate. Uh, what I wanted to kind of just touch base is the measures that can be implemented. And when I'm thinking about implementing measures, I think that we have, or the companies, will have to act proactively. Because if you wait until the year end, then it's going to be too late, and then you're going to be facing year end adjustments, which will have huge impacts on your financial statements. It's going to be difficult to calculate them. So the, the first kind of important message is, you need to start as soon as possible to understand how your year-end financial service uh, financial statements will look like. Now, when we're talking about potential measures, uh, I'm just going to liaise to what Stefan said, and then there is the kind of uh, possibility to amend the contractual relationship and to reduce or even eliminate the profits of routine entities where we have principal structures. Because normally we know that these limited risk distributors or contract manufacturers or other kind of structures are still exposed to a certain risks. So amending the transfer pricing policy and the contractual re uh, relationship between the parties might kind of reduce their profit level to uh, a, a non-cash uh, uh, outflow uh, of, of a non-cash tax outflow at the end of the year. Then. We have some other industries like uh, retail or like hospitality and travel industries where uh, subsidiaries are already facing significant difficulties in order to operate. And for these, we have to understand how are we going to structure this market, su uh, market support payment? Is it going to be reflected in the PL or will it only be a balance sheet item with limited PL uh, 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 kind of uh, impact? So this is. Uh, an, an important thing to bear in mind. Then the third one is what we can do is we can, uh, and this was done during the last crisis, uh, financial crisis of uh, 2008, 2009, was the temporary suspension and abolition of license fees or service fees. And uh, at that time, there was also a lot of kind of uh, delivery of goods, which was done on a cost minus basis. Now, these are all kind of uh, uh, potential uh, solutions, but I would just like to stress to everybody, if you're doing these things, you also have to consider what is the correlation that we're having with customs and with VAT, because there's going to be a difference uh, as, as opposed to the historical uh, fact pattern. Then uh, we have the uh, financial services, uh, the financial transactions, where we can kind of try to amend the contractual terms and basically to reduce the interest rates to make sure that our subsidiaries and group companies are able to survive this. And uh, if the contractual arrangements are allowing for it, you could do during this downturn to a temporary kind of interest-free loan uh, a facility, which could help with the, with the cash flow needs. Finally, for all the uh, business restructuring uh, transactions, and I think the uh, by that, I, I'm referring to the transfer of functions or to the transfer of intangible property. Perhaps there is an opportunity to do a kind of uh, a retroactive adjustment of the uh, purchase price uh, because of these COVID-19 impacts that they're having on the business. So I, these are just a couple of things that I wanted you to consider as measures that, uh, that could be implemented. Now, these measures need to be aligned to your specific business. So to your specific transfer pricing policy with the contractual framework and to the kind of operating model that you have implemented. And in this kind of, uh, uh, in view of this, we just made a step-by-step -step approach on what companies could be doing during these times to ensure that uh, they get on the other side of the crisis with a, with a sound transfer pricing system. Stefan, would you guide everybody to, to the next slide? Yeah, thanks, thanks for giving us this overview on the different measurements. 
And, and like you rightfully said, of course, not all of these measures would be applicable to all of our listeners today. But what we try to do in, in, in this slide is to give you like a, a general approach of how to identify maybe the right measurements that you could in, uh, enforce on your organization and how to how to deal with this uh, COVID-19 crisis from a trench pricing perspective on the short term and also on the medium term. So obviously any any kind of um, projects need to start with a screening and an understanding of the situation. So in this case, we need to understand what is the tax situation of my multinational group and what is my existing transfer pricing system. So do I have a written policy? And if yes, what are the conditions laid out in there? How flexible is this transfer pricing policy? Or maybe I don't have a written transfer pricing policy because the transfer pricing policy has organically evolved within my organization, but there is no, no written documents that actually specifies what are the, the conditions that I'm agreeing upon. So this is the first basis I would I would say that we need to establish to to start with our analysis because the analysis then should focus on okay so what are the specific reasons that that are creating the losses or the reduction in profits that I'm currently seeing so where are these coming from and then uh, I'll turn uh, sorry then ideally what I would also then see is what is the decision-making process within my organization to justify these losses? So what decisions have been made that could support the loss allocation to a specific country? So um, this becomes important when we talk about the documentation at a later point. But for now, for the analysis, of, obviously it's important to understand where are these losses coming from and where do we want them to have. Then the next step would be to actually think about what are the different measures that are applicable to me and which ones do I want to implement now, knowing that I want to reduce my cash tax. So this is, this is I think, the, the ultimate goal that, that we talked at the very beginning already. So we need to identify what are the measurements that I can implement now that have an immediate effect. This leads to the implementation. So, and like Philip mentioned, there should or could be an impact on either creating intercompany agreements that would reflect my measurements that I want to implement, or maybe there was never an agreement. So I need to put an agreement in place to reflect what I want to apply on this specific transaction or for this specific entity going forward. Because this leads us then to the medium term um, aspect of this project, in which is the documentation. Because at some point, the tax authorities may ask you for your transfer pricing documentation and i know that in the middle east transfer pricing documentation is still not high on the agenda of the tax authorities but if you look back into the last five to ten years we see there is a clear trend for countries to implement transfer pricing um, regulations and now with the recent BEPS developments i think it's safe to say that within the next five years transfer pricing regulations will be present in probably all countries in, in also in the Middle East. So and to have a robust documentation, we need to do the analysis that I just described before. So we need to document basically all our decision steps that we have taken to be able to justify them towards the tax authorities. So this will be the understanding my situation to documentation of what I want to achieve going forward. Uh, as a small overview of what we think is a reasonable approach towards transfer pricing. And uh, Stefan, I'm just going to jump in here and to say that transfer pricing is by nature a cross-border transaction. So when you're doing this step-by-step -step approaches, don't do it only one-sided. If you are part of a multinational group, as Stefan mentioned, make sure that the kind of all tax contents in different jurisdictions are aligned, provide their input, because what works in one country or what works in the headquarter might not be uh, uh, received positively in one of the other jurisdictions. So it should be a team effort. Uh, with this, I think that I'm going to bring it back to Reese to continue with the discussion. 
Thanks, uh, gentlemen. Look, from a, a layman's point of view, and I use that when I'm a VAT practitioner. I mean, what I understand about transfer pricing is that the the underlying principle is that profit should be taxed in the country where the substantive activity occurs, um, which, of course, then to my way of thinking, plays into concepts like permanent establishment and economic substance and so forth. So, how do you see? If I can pose the question, how do you see the you know the current disruption disruption to trade flows and the movement of people? How does that play into concepts of PE where people have sort of taken positions that may now be called into question because of the facts on the ground have changed? Uh, thanks, Ethan. That really is an interesting question because um, I would assume that most of our listeners today including also me, are today working from a place that they did not anticipate at the beginning of the year. So there is a lot of uh, movement within the workforce and also at the management level where people have moved their place of work from, from one country to another country. And of course, that has an impact from an inter international tax point. And yes, uh, the PE impact is is uh, quite critical. And can we go to the next slide where I will just lay out a bit of, of what are what is basically the, the, the core of the issue. So like we discussed, employees have dislocated back to their home countries. So if I if I look at it from a Saudi perspective, we have a lot of expats that were working with our multinational companies that have relocated back to their home countries and are now working from their homes. So this could be the UAE, this could be Lebanon, this could be India, this could be Pakistan. We know there's a huge expat community of people that have uh, relocated now back to their home countries and that they, and they're working from their homes now for the Saudi business, if we, if we stick to the Saudi example. So of course, then the question would arise, depending on your local legislation, does the presence of an an employee of a Saudi entity, let's say in Lebanon, does it create a PE for the Saudi entity in Lebanon? And if yes, what would be the additional consequences of, of the PE? So obviously we would think about what are the filing requirements and what will be my tax obligations on, on, on this PE. So there are so this is basically the the underlying issue that, that we're having there that people that are performing the business or that are performing business for, let's say, a Saudi entity are now performing this activity from different locations outside Saudi. So obviously this is a question that not one country specifically can answer, but this is, a, I would say, a global phenomenon that needs to be addressed. And I'm, I'm not sure, Philip, are you aware of any OECD uh, guidance on that? Well, this is a kind of positive news because OECD has been issuing a number of papers and guidances on what they wish to, to see from a kind of double tax treaty perspective or from the cross-border uh, movement of, of workers. And uh, what OECD is saying is that because this is a temporary relocation, which is forced by the government measures, that just having people in one country or the other shouldn't kind of lead to the creation of a home office permanent establishment or an agency permanent establishment in case where these people are actively signing contracts for, for their business. Now, this is, I, see, I, I would say, wishful thinking. And I know that a kind of uh, a number of uh, countries in the West Europe uh, has been uh, lenient in imposing kind of any restrictions or penalties, so they have been, uh, let's say, ge generally in line with the OECD. But it is also a question of whether countries in the GCC will apply this approach. And so there, I, re I, I know that you were kind of uh, this discussing about the permanent establishment concept. So can you see, or is there any guidance that came out from the, from the Kuwaiti authorities on what's gonna happen during this time of crisis? Yeah, thanks, Philip. No, I, I mean, it's a good, good question. I think it's a very pertinent uh, discussion, even from a Kuwait perspective, because as I highlighted in my earlier slide, because there is no definition of permanent establishment in the local legislation. Um, and effectively, in terms of OECD guidelines, Kuwait has, has given an intention to implement, but 
they have not implemented at all and i think there is any regulations going through at this stage so i think this particularly is raising a high risk for uh, for employees who are here on a visit so effectively if they have a kuwait sourced income or any kuwait sourced contract there is a potential it creates a potential exposure and uh, to give you a practical side to it i've mean, got a couple of our you know global mnc clients who have actually told us that their employees are stuck in kuwait for a bit and they are requesting us to assess their pe position so i think it's a very important point and i would recommend that if you are in the gcc and you have this situation you should take appropriate advice yeah yeah or at least the track thanks a lot zubair I'll, I'll i'll go to because we were going through the kind of uh, transfer pricing and with BAPS, we had the substance over form. Uh, then we went through the permanent establishment, which was where is the substance located? And then in line with the BAPS initiatives, we have also in the region, the emergence of kind of economic substance rules. So if I can just go to the next slide. And uh, I just wanted to give a kind of first here, a general update that uh, apart from uh, uh, the UAE and Bahrain, which didn't see kind of specific guidance, which is related to COVID times, but uh, other countries like Jersey, like Guernsey, and like other kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, UK-based sub-jurisdictions were, uh, were issuing guidance where they said, okay, there are substance rules, but uh, they follow the OECD model and they said, well, if you have temporary dislocations, which are not kind of uh, voluntary, then we might accept that substance still exists, providing that it is performed. Uh, and uh, we expect that when the time of the pandemic passes, that substance will return to its rightful place. I just wanted to kind of do a breakdown of uh, the UAE ESR regulations in a nutshell. And I know that a, a lot of you have heard about the relevant activities that are subject to ESR. And that there is a vast uh, kind of uh, spread of activities from banking, insurance, but also to distribution and service centers, headquarters, holding companies, and IP companies, which kind of uh, impose a wide uh, net on, 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 on entities operating in the UAE. Now, normally, when, where we start, it was always the question of, uh, are you a government entity? And if you were a government entity or uh, uh, an entity which is a major, uh, which major shareholder is the government, then you would be out of scope of uh, ESR rules. I just want to note here that some of the free trade zones still do impose notification requirements, even if you are a government entity, they kind of require you to, uh, to, to submit the notification. Now, if you are not a government entity, then you would have the question, of are you carrying relevant activities and are you deriving income in the UE from this relevant activity? And uh, for these questions, whether you are carrying or not, or whether you had income or not, you were supposed or you are supposed to file an ESR notification. Now, this ESR notification deadline is approaching very fast. Uh, now, it has been postponed by some of the uh, kind of regulatory authorities and free trade zones for 30 of June. There are others like DAFSA, which still is maintaining the 3rd of May for the for the submission of the notification. So although the the COVID is here and the pandemic is here, the substance is not going away and compliance requirements are still there. Then uh, just to reinforce this, the Ministry of Finance recently issued a guide on relevant activities, which provided kind of further insights on how the uh, how they see the implementations and gave a couple of uh, uh, pointers on uh, what is the core income generating activities and what is, is it that they see for adequate resources or the management functions. Now, they are working on it, and I think that this is not going anywhere. So if you do kind of uh, pass these two tests, you have the diagram here, and then basically you will have to carry out the economic substance test. Now, this is a, a, a thing that should have been done in 2019, because don't forget the uh, economic substance rules are applicable as of 1st of January, 2019. 
So I think that for this first reporting period, we're not even seeing COVID-19 impacts because this is related to 2019. Now, failure to comply has a kind of significant financial penalties, uh, also suspension, withdrawal, or non-renewal of the trade license, and finally, uh, reputational risk due to the automatic exchange of information between tax authorities. And my point that I wanted to, to raise is this one. I know that a lot of people were thinking that this is a kind of pure compliance activity, that we are just submitting these papers to the free trade zones, and this is it. So perhaps they didn't understand the full extent of, of these rules. Now, what I'm seeing is that uh, uh, UAE and Bahrain have implemented these rules as a response to the OECD uh, tax forum uh, on, uh, on harmful tax practices. And uh, when implemented, I think that there is going to be a peer review, which will come in the years to come to see whether this was implemented properly by the UAE. So in my thinking, I think that there is a big chance that the enforcement and the monitoring of the proper application of economic substance rules goes to the federal tax administration as the kind of most mature body to collect and enforce taxes in the EU. And, you know, the FTA, I'm, I have Lise here, who's the lead of a VAT for UAE. How do you see the kind of enforcement of compliance by the federal tax authorities if this happens? Certainly, so far as VAT is concerned here in the UAE, uh, in a single word, strict. There is tends to be a, a zero tolerance policy on forgiveness for errors and, you know, maximum penalties are usually in, imposed as a matter of course. So uh, if the FTA is regulating this as it looks like they probably will, I think we should anticipate being held to the absolute letter of the law with very little leeway for, you know, taking reasonable care and so forth. Thanks a lot. I think that this is it from ESR. And then just wanted to touch base shortly on advanced tax rulings as a tool to combat uncertainty. And I just wanted a kind of brief overview of Zubair. Is there a possibility to do so in uh, in Kuwait? Or what is the, the kind of uh, situation? Can I apply for a COVID-19 related advanced tax ruling? In terms of the COVID-19, haven't seen anything, but just to give you an update, uh, what's recently happened, until recently, you couldn't really apply for a tax ruling on a tax position you take or any transactions. But what they've done recently is that they've allowed uh, effectively the ruling for your taxability. So if you are a pure supplier and as the law is silent, so they allow you to actually take a ruling in terms of submit all your contracts and if they can Contracts are clearly saying with a confirmation that you do not have any, you know, effectively presence in Kuwait. So they are issuing a no objection letter for the release of any retention. So as it's a quasi pre-ruling, which I think we are, and again, in the COVID-19 situation, we can potentially look at that to say, if people visit here and that's going to create a risk of PE. I think that is something that can be sort of, you know, explored further um, in, in Kuwait as well. Thanks. And Stefan, I know that the KSA has the kind of new amnesty program, which is very useful for the past, but can we also approach the Gazette and uh, kind of try to secure the position from a transfer pricing perspective for this and the next years? So, yes, and uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the amnesty program because I, I spoke with a couple of our local partners and uh, they confirmed that this is a uh, historic movement, so they have never seen such a widespread amnesty that currently uh, the Gazette has, has offered. So um, I would encourage everybody on this webcast to have a look at their tax position in Saudi and see if they can benefit from, uh, from this amnesty program. And yes, there's always the possibility to, to approach Gazette and to agree with them on um, deemed profit rate or any other type of, of transfer pricing arrangement that would secure the treatment of a specific transaction or a specific entity going forward. So just to put this into perspective, let's look at the past and then let's see what can be done for the future. Thanks. And I'm just going to throw uh, to the wider audience that if you have an advanced tax ruling, which is applicable 
in this year. But you have to take a look and understand what are you going to do with it? Because normally in an advanced pricing agreement, you're committing yourself to maintain one, uh, a, a certain level of profitability, which due to these circumstances might not be able to achieve. So the question is, do you cancel it? Do you amend it? Do you uh, provide for a downturn and uh, a normal kind of uh, uh, segregation of, of results? And how do you derive the downturn comparability? I'm conscious of times, and I know that we have uh, a, a number of questions, so I'm just going to leave it there. But even for the existing APAs, there is a number of things that, that you need to consider in order to come up to the, to the victor side at, at, at year end. Back to you, Riz. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you, gentlemen, for an excellent discussion. As you say, we have had a, a few questions come through, some of which kind of overlap. So I might paraphrase them down a, a little bit for you, if that's okay. Um, so, firstly, for, for you, uh, Philip, we've had some questions around um, what do you think the impact will be on, on all of the work that the OECD has done over the last few years on BEPS? What kind of impact do you see that this, uh, the COVID situation will have on you know, particular Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, perhaps? I'm uh, glad that you're asking this question because the work on, OEC on Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 has not stopped. If anything, I think that the work has been accelerating because on one side, OECD wants to catch uh, the, the kind of tax base related to the winners of the COVID-19, which is usually technology companies. So they are determined to make sure that digital is assessed and properly repatriated among world, uh, that the taxing rights are kind of properly allocated uh, uh, around the world. And then on pillar two, by introducing a pillar to uh, OECD is hoping that they might kind of soften the impacts of the of, of, of the COVID-19 by granting more taxing rights and by making sure that these are applied. So I think that uh, it, it is still ongoing and that we are on track to get the kind of results in November. Thank you. Now I have a, a question for uh, Zubair. Um, uh, so, uh, so the question goes that you know you mentioned that the Kuwaiti Ministry of Finance is working remotely, um, and that they can issue a no objection letter for the release of tax retentions, but only where the field inspection has finished, as the the questioner understands it. Um, how do you think that might work in in practice? That's a very good question, Reese. And so I think what what we started doing now because it's just very very recent uh, sort of input that we have received from the Ministry of Finance is that we've got the specific inspector who's been dealing with the file. So on their MOF emails, we are sending uh, the documentations in terms of the information of, the, of, you know, effectively confirmation of the file number, uh, the date the inspections were completed, um, and particularly the head of inspections copied as well. And then we are requesting based on that, that a, a no objection letter is issued to the contract owners. And to be fair, I think just today I received uh, on the NOL for supplies, I think is the first time that I think this system has actually worked. So we just received 12 NOLs for some of our clients, which I think is a, is, um, is a testament that is actually happening and people can then go to their contract owner and request the 5% uh, retention back on the contract. So I think definitely, I think, uh, uh, Ministry of Finance is working hard on that, and I think we are able to support as well. We are required to release these funds uh, for the corporates in these difficult times. That that is good news, and that, that the system is working. Maybe uh, just uh, perhaps let me combine two questions for Stefan regarding um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, firstly, you know the the questioner has observed that. Perhaps a more general question that transfer pricing has been in place in Saudi for just on 12 months and was looking for a general overview of how you think it's been bettered down. And then a second question also on Saudi is if maybe you could give us some comments to the um, to the audience around that, uh, you know, the, the PE question with dislocated workforces. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so let's take them one by one. So, uh, first of all, transfer pricing has been introduced by March. 2019 applicable for financial years 2018 forward so we have like you just mentioned a 12 50 months window of experience so far um, and 
to be honest, when when I heard about this quick development that, that happened, because we need to remind ourselves that the guidelines were issued in March and the first filing was actually due in April. So there was really just a, a very short time window to, to implement transfer pricing documentation and the documents in, in the organizations. And we didn't see many transfer pricing audits coming coming from um, from these filings. Um, but this had, had changed over the last two to three months. So there we saw that there was a specific, I would say, scheme of things happening at the Gazette. So they specifically were, were targeting branches of, of foreign head offices. They were looking at market and support uh, entities, and they were obviously looking at loss makers and parts of, of CBCR groups. So I would say there were a couple of, of uh, criteria that they apparently have applied on, on the Gazet side, and they started targeting specifically these, these type of entities to ask for the transfer pricing documentation. But obviously now with COVID-19, this has all been put on hold, although Gaz is still working, but um, I would expect this, this uh, audit activity to be picked up after the amnesty expires. So probably in July, August, I would expect that there's the next wave of, of uh, tax and transfer pricing audits coming along. So that's for the general overview. Um, for the um, dislocated workforce in Saudi, so obviously Saudi has a very strict regime or, or used to a very strict regime on people allowed to enter Saudi and to work in Saudi. So the first question that, that we need to ask, if somebody now is stranded in Saudi, under which visa did he enter into Saudi, and then to see what is the what is the tax treatment for this. So from now, there is no specific guidance from the from the um, Gazette coming. Um, but knowing their tendency to follow OCD principles, I would say let's follow the OCD principles. But in short, there's no there's no guidance from the OCD yes, from from Gazette yet. So it needs to be assessed on an individual basis to see under which regime are these people currently in Saudi and what will this mean from a taxation point of view. Okay, so, so a, a, a live risk to be monitored. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. With one eye on the clock, I don't think we should uh, prevail on people's time too too long. We've, we've, uh, we've just about run out. Um, I think it's now a good time, therefore, to draw our session to a close uh, for the audience. Uh, I hope you found this presentation helpful and uh, ask that you provide feedback through the through the feedback questionnaire so that we can continue to improve. I will also note that you uh, you should receive an invitation shortly for next week's session, which will focus on uh, mer <laughs> mergers and acquisitions, transactions and sovereign wealth funds within the, within the region. Um, so with that, on your behalf, uh, I thank Zubair, Stefan and Philip and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.